Experiment 1, Physical Properties of Matter Density. These slides should not serve as a substitute for you reading the pre-lab material in the lab manual, but should serve as a extra bonus help assistance for the material in that lab manual. So just a little bit of explanation on what is density, what you're going to be studying about density in the lab, and uh, how you can potentially identify an unknown from measuring its density. I say potentially identify because it's not just an absolute. There are things whose densities are very close to each other. Uh, for example, methanol and ethanol have very similar densities, and you don't want to mess up and drink the wrong one because 10 milliliters of methanol, wood alcohol, will blind you and 100 will kill you. Whereas ethanol, if your age and religion permit, is drinking alcohol. So let's kick it off with what is density. The units of many quantities in chemistry will tell you how to determine them. Uh, the units will help you to solve a problem. So for example, the unit of density is oftentimes grams per milliliter for solids and liquids and grams per liter for gases. Grams per milliliter, mass per unit volume, per meaning divided by or over, m over v, mass over volume, mass per unit volume. So what that means is if you find the mass and you find the volume, you just divide the volume into the mass and you get the density. Now if you have any two variables in that equation, you can solve for the missing one. So for example, if you find the density and you find the mass, you could determine the volume. Or if you find the density and find the volume, you could determine the mass. And depending on the situation, you might need one or the other of those things. Uh, for example, if you have a certain capacity truck and it's filled with a uh, liquid, if you know the density of the liquid and you know the volume of the truck, you can determine the mass of the truck the mass of the liquid put into the truck and you add it to the empty uh, mass of the truck. Why is that important? You don't want to get a ticket for driving an overweight truck. Again, the units for, are for liquids and solids are grams per milliliter and grams per liter for gases because gases are so light. Uh, having a bunch of decimal places with zeros and, and in it for uh, the density of a gas, if you wanted to have it in grams per milliliter, uh, just it's not as practical. So we uh, divide it by 1,000 and, and make it grams per liter. Remember, especially if you're going into the health professions, that a milliliter is a cubic centimeter, a cc. The reason that that unit persists in medicine for so long is because back in the old days when you had a typewriter and you were trying to type a superscript, you had to physically reach up and roll the carriage of the typewriter back to type the superscript 3. And so they didn't want to do that. It took too long. So they just wrote cc and yet the unit persists. A cc is a cm cubed, a centimeter times a centimeter times a centimeter, a centimeter by a centimeter by a centimeter, a centimeter on three sides of a cube, a cubic centimeter, which is by definition a milliliter, one one thousandth, that's the milli part of a liter. And the last bullet point on the slide says that, again, you can use this as a confirmation of identity or a clue in guessing the identity, but it is not the be-all, end-all of if it has this density, it, it, this compound for sure, because uh, it might not be. It might not be. So your objectives for the lab are to determine the density of a metal bar and identify it from a list of unknowns. Since we, I'm giving you a list of unknowns in the lab manual, uh, you know it's one of those things in the list. And so therefore, we can pretty unequivocally identify our unknown solid. Ditto for a liquid. You're going to measure the density of that liquid and determine its identity from a list of possibilities. And then in part three, you're going to confirm the density of air because we know what it is. You're going to confirm its density and calculate a percent error. How far off are you? And as part of your lab report, you should be able to explain why 
you were, had a density that was too high or too low for air, why your density may have been slightly too high or too low for your solid or liquid as well. So in order to measure the density of our unknown solid and our unknown liquid, we're going to use uh, two different precision measuring devices. We're going to use a graduated cylinder, which is the item on the left here, which uh, measures volumes pretty, pretty precisely. And it is generally a to contain type of measuring device, meaning if I put five milliliters in this graduated cylinder, half full, because this is a 10 milliliter graduated cylinder, if I put 5.00 milliliters in this thing, that's how much it would contain. Doesn't necessarily mean that's how much it would pour out. The pipette, this thing on the right hand side, which I gave a close up of here, um, typically is a to deliver TD measuring volume measuring device, meaning that you fill it up to the 10 milliliter line, and this is plus or minus 0 0.02 milliliters, really, really, really precise. The uh, graduated cylinder is slightly less precise than that. Um, but if you let it drain on its own, the pipette, it will deliver 10.00 milliliters. This one happens to have also on it a to contain line, uh, which if you fill it to that line and then blow it out, it would, it would contain that number of milliliters. But generally speaking, you do not blow out pipettes and therefore they are almost always, this is an anomaly here, they are almost always to deliver volume measuring devices. Now just a word on the analog measuring a volume with a graduated cylinder. This graduated cylinder is in two tenths of a milliliter divisions. Uh, there's like nine and then the 9.2, 9.4, 9.6, 9.8, .9 and then 10. Since it is in tenths, roughly, I mean, it's technically two tenths, but it, since it, it measures to one decimal place, you must guess the next decimal place. Because if it's exactly on, say, the 9.2 line, then you have to write 9.20. Otherwise, whoever is reading your paper is going to assume that it was somewhere between 9 and 10, but closer to 9, and you guessed the 0.2 part. Right? A digital instrument, like a, like a balance, we'll talk about that one in a minute, the last digit is being guessed for you electronically. But on analog measuring devices like the graduated cylinder, you have to guess the last decimal place. If it was just in one milliliter increments, nine and then 10, you would have to guess how close it is to the nine or the 10, but it's in two tenth divisions. So you can decide, is it between the 9.2 and the 9.4? Is it exactly in the middle? Then it's 9.30. Is it a little bit closer to the 0.4 line? All right, then it's 9.35. You have to guess one more decimal place always if your measuring device is analog do make sure that your meniscus is on the line. The meniscus is U-shaped, and so it needs to be on the line of the pipette. Wherever the meniscus is in the graduated cylinder, you read from the bottom of it. Uh, one old school note here, not to pipette by mouth. Um, back in the old days, you used to have a little rubber hose that you'd hook up to the top of the pipette to suck the liquid up into it. Uh, don't do that. They don't ship them with the little hoses anymore, although they stopped relatively recently within the last 10 years. Um, but do not suck anything up into the pipette. Do not blow anything out of the pipette. It is designed to deliver on its own the proper volume. So a balance is just that, a balance and not a scale. A scale measures weight. It's like in your bathroom. Uh, balance is a precision uh, mass measuring device. We say weigh all the time just because it's harder to say obtain the mass of something because that's what you mean mass is not a verb weigh you can use as a verb so go weigh it is a whole lot easier than saying go obtain the mass of that thing on a balance but we always mean obtain the mass as a rule the more precise the more decimal places your balance gives you the more expensive it is so the balance on the right here with only two decimal places costs about 200 bucks the balance on the left here with four decimal places costs about 1200 bucks. They're both digital, 
the hundredths place, the second decimal place on this balance is being guessed electronically by the instrument. Uh, somewhere on here it would say plus or minus 0 0.03 or 0 0.04 or something like that. On the four decimal place balance, 0 0.0000. Uh, the ten thousandths place is being guessed by the balance. You pay for that precision. Treat these balances with great care because you don't want your tuition dollars going to replace the balances. You want them to go to paying your professors <laughs> and giving you a quality education. So you never poured anything directly onto the balance. And if you had, say, a beaker on this pan here and you were adding something to the beaker, you would take the beaker out of the balance first before adding something to it. Sometimes you want to just uh, put a put the beaker on there but not care about the mass of the beaker and then you use the tear button, T-A-R-E, which is the, or sometimes it's just simply called the zero button. And that just tells the balance, pretend like this beaker doesn't weigh anything. Pretend like this piece of paper that I'm gonna put stuff on doesn't weigh anything. How do I do that? By hitting the tear button. Then when I take it off, the balance is going to go negative, which is fine. I'll put my stuff onto my paper or in my beaker, and then I put it back in the balance, and it gives me the mass of only the stuff on the paper or in the beaker, which is convenient and can save you some time. But in some of the labs, it specifically says, get the weight of the paper with nothing on it. Get the weight of the uh, beaker with nothing in it and make sure that you follow the instructions. A lot of this lab is about learning to follow instructions because when you get a job, there's going to be rules and instructions in that job. And that's the skill that you're, one of the skills that you're gaining in the lab. It's not about training you to become a chemist because very few of you have any desire whatsoever to do that. And that's fine, we get that, it's cool. When I was in college, I didn't plan on becoming a college chemistry professor, that's for very certain. And here we are. We're training you to obtain skills that will be of use to you in your job, no matter what that job may be. So here's a question for you. What is the reading on this balance? And it's 71.1326 grams. Why did I ask you this very simple question? Because it never fails. I look at somebody's data sheet in the lab, and if this was their reading of their balance, they write down 71.13. And I ask, where are the other two numbers? And they look at me and say, uh -huh. write down all the numbers on the balance. You paid for them. Sometimes they'll say, well, but the instructions said uh, to, to four decimal places. And I say, yes, four decimal places, not four numbers, four decimal places. That's the number of decimal places on this balance. One, three, two, six. Write all the numbers down. You're paying for that balance. Use the balance. So we can determine the density from the mass and the volume. So if we, in one step, obtain the mass of the bar by putting it on a balance, and in another step, we'd obtain the volume by putting it into a graduated cylinder full of water, not full of water, but that has water in it, and we see how much the water goes up when we put the bar in, well, then we've just obtained the volume of the bar. It's a convenient way of obtaining the volume of irregular solids by submerging them in a liquid. We measure the volume of the liquid without our solid submerged in it, and then we measure the volume of our liquid with the solid submerged in it. And the volume goes up by the volume of the solid that we submerged into it. We divide our mass by our volume, and we get our density. So for example, if we have a 2.00 cubic centimeter cc milliliter, however you want to say it, sample of aluminum is found to weigh 5.40 grams. Calculate the density of aluminum. Easy enough. 5.4 grams over the 2.00 milliliters gives us 2.70 grams per milliliter, which is in fact the density of aluminum. So if you had a sort of silvery, shiny-ish piece of metal, 
and it had a density of 2.70 grams per milliliter, you could surmise that it is highly likely to be aluminum or aluminium if you're from England. So what can go wrong in the lab? This is what you need to think about for every single lab. This is problem solving, which is a very valuable job skill. What could make your result, your densities be higher than expected? Is your mass too big or is it too little? Is your volume too big or is it too little? And what might cause the mass to be too high or too low or the volume to be too high or too low? So you need to think about the algebra involved, mass divided by volume. Would a too big, in quotes, mass result in a density that is too high or too low? And what could cause mass to be, quote, too high? Keep in mind, final bullet point on here, that mistakes are not valid sources of error. I spilled some liquid, so therefore the volume was low. No, that that's not a valid source of error, okay? you spilled some liquid, correct the problem. Go back and do that step again. All right? Mistakes are not valid sources of error. Blaming the stock room is not a valid source of error. They must have put the wrong label on the model. No, you can't do that. If you want to get into these crazy theoretical possibilities, then what I always say is you could blame it on a rabid monkey running into the lab and pooping in the flask because that is almost as likely as the stockroom putting the wrong label on something. You can't just make up reasons either, okay? There are inherent things in the lab. Your sam liquid sample evaporated because uh, the lab was uh, so hot that day. That's a reasonable source of error. If the volume is low because your sample evaporated after you weighed it, then your volume is going to be too low and your density is going to be too high higher than the tabulated value. That's a reasonable source of error. That is not a monkey pooping in the flask or a stockroom person going crazy and putting the wrong label on something. You have to think of valid, plausible sources of error so that it, you can demonstrate an understanding of what is going on in the lab. So with that, I leave you to it. Enjoy your first experiment and be safe.